Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and I'm super excited today because we have a very special guest. So we're going to be doing a countdown of some of the best pauper cards in Eldritch Moon, and joining me is one of my favorite pauper people, Alex Ullman. So Alex is super awesome in the pauper scene. He's one of the editors at Gathering Magic, makes some of the best pauper content on the internet, so you should definitely check out Gathering Magic for his articles, and also Facebook and Twitter. Uh, is it Nerd to the Core, Alex? Is that how that, people can find you? That's right. Uh, you know, I'm really happy I was able to get that name eight years ago or something on Twitter, so... Yeah, you must have jumped on that right away because that's a pretty good one. Very excited. And excited to be here. Really like what you guys do over on uh, Goldfish, so happy to be a part of it. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm super excited. So today we're going to count down the eight best cards from Eldritch Moon for Popper. We're going to start off with number eight, which we kind of have a tie here because it's two cards that kind of go in the same archetype. Borrowed Grace, a new kind of anthem pump spell, and also... We have Thraben Standard Bearer. So, Alex, what are your thoughts on these? Where do they fit in Popper? So there's a really popular strategy of mono-white tokens, sometimes called Soul Sisters when it runs Souls Attendant, Souls Warden, Main. There's also a white-red version with Rally the Peasants from Eternal Masters. And the goal is to just flood the board with things like Squadron Hawk, Raise the Alarm, Battle Screech, Triplicate Spirits, and these both fit really well into that archetype. Borrowed Grace, there are better power pump effects between Guardian's Pledge and Rally the Peasants, but it's that ability to give toughness boost because this deck is incredibly vulnerable to electricery and has to run some you know, pretty bad cards to get around that. Cards like Veteran Armorer, which is okay, but it doesn't really go with the strategy. It kind of eats up a slot when you really want to be putting out two one ones. This at least allows your power boost to double as a toughness boost as well. And so now Electricery is a little harder to resolve. It does cost three, so it's kind of expensive. But again, it, it comes at the right point in the curve. Thraben Standard Bearer is a little bit more exciting to me. These decks, the token decks, can run out of gas or start drawing extra lands late. And to try and mitigate that, some of them have run cards like Sends Enlistment, you know, from Eventide. Three and a white sorcery, retrace, so you can discard a land to cast it again, and it makes two one ones. Yeah, two is better than one, but two mana is way less expensive than four mana, and you can do it at instant speed. So what you get is a one one, which can just churn out tokens in the late game. But it also has the ad advantage of if you don't get to four mana, you can pitch a battle screech. You can pitch a rally the peasants and get value from it later. You can also pitch a card like Sends Enlistment if you're going for a little bit of a longer, grindier game. And now you have extra spells in your graveyard. I'm a huge fan of anything that can convert land turn three and beyond into a resource, an offensive resource. So I think Thraben Standard Bearer is really the card that stands out. But Borrowed Grace just, I, I tend to underestimate these cards, the Anthem effect, so I'm a little uh, bullish on it. Yeah, Borrowed Grace seems like something you could at least put in your sideboard to, for mm -hmm. electric rematchups potentially. So uh, I think that's a good call on both of those. Thraben Standard Bearer, something you would main deck most likely? I I'm a little off kilter with my tokens builds but i'd probably run at least two maybe even three main the the investment cost is so low you want a one drop anyway and right now a one drop that can turn on other one drops you know turn two you can leave up mana for raise the alarm or leave up mana for an extra token regardless and you're committing to the board at no real cost so i i think main deck is very reasonable Sweet. Well, moving on on our list, we now have a black card at number seven. And this is kind of the black divination, Scumble to Temptation. So tell me about this one, Alex. Yeah, so Mono Black Controls was a, is a very popular deck that's not as strong right now. And it kind of relies on Sign and Blood, you, you know, really powerful card. With Theros came out, Black got access to Read the Bones, which is 
potentially better because it scries two over the draw two, but it costs three. Eternal Masters had Knight's Whisper. The thing that tie all these cards together is that they are sorceries. So that means any kind of black-based, grindy control deck had to commit on two or three on their own turn to gain any sort of card advantage that wasn't attached to a Chittering Rats or a Phyrexian Rager. Succumb to Temptation being an instant kind of flips everything on its ear in that now black decks can run Ravenous Rats or Augur of Skulls at two to kind of start discarding cards earlier from the opponent and can leave up three mana for either Succumb to Temptation or other really powerful cards right now, like Unmake or Complete Disregard, both of which are exile effects, which are extremely potent at the moment. Um, This would be higher if there was a deck that was perfect for it. I I talked about Mono Black Control liking its card draw on the two, and that's because it has a lot of really, really good three drops. It has Chittering Rats, it has Phyrexian Rager, it has Liliana Spectre, Uh, It has Crypt Rats, you know, a card that hasn't seen a ton of play yet, but is also very good, is Wake Dancer on three. So Succumb to Temptation is probably one of the more powerful cards for Pauper and Eldritch Moon. It just doesn't have a home right now. Moving on to number six, we have a colorless card, which is actually kind of a blue card. So we have Wretched Griff, the big Emerge Flyer. So uh, is this something that you are looking to abuse with Muldrifter, maybe? Yeah, Muldrifter into this is pretty good. The thing that excites me most about Wretched Griff is that it's a cash trigger. So I- I've been playing with this card a little bit. And I've had people counter it, just straight up counter spell, <laughs> which is amazing because it's a 3-4 body, so it's, it's a reasonable creature, but they have to deal with it somehow. And no matter what, you're getting a card back. There's nothing like this in Popper, except for another card that's coming a little bit later on our list. You can't stop the card. So what does that mean? Well, it means that even if they use a removal spell, even if they use a counter spell, exclude is a great card because it gains you card advantage. You stop their creature and you gain a card. You replace the card you spent. Wretched Griff breaks even with exclude. That just, it changes the math on any kind of card advantage matchup. By costing seven, it's a natural Tron card. So if you have Ursa's Tron, which is common, you can cast this. Uh, Mold Drifter makes it cost one and a blue. So that's absurd you know there's this card out there called Wormfang drake from judgment which is a three four for two and a blue when it enters the battlefield you have to exile one of your own creatures but when it leaves the battlefield that creature comes back into play so if you go say mold drifter into Wormfang drake and then Wormfang drake into retro Griff, it's just all the cards <laughs> now, that that's not going to happen reasonably but it's not unreasonable for there to be a deck that runs, say, Arbor Elf and Utopia Sprawl on turn one and two, and then also Fierce Empath, which is a really strong tutor. Fierce Empath gets this card, and if you set your Utopia Sprawl to blue, you can get turn one Arbor Elf Forest, turn two Forest into Utopia Sprawl on blue, use those lands to cast Fierce Empath getting Wretched Griff, turn three you have a wretched griff. That's really a really strong opening and could be fast enough to make headway in Popper. It also seems pretty big in the air compared to Delvers and Fairies and some of the other flyers that I've seen in the format. There's not much that really uh, profitably blocks this in the air, is there? I once attacked with a wretched griff in a test game and they blocked with two mold drifters. Now, granted, they they were up four cards. I was up one because of Wretched Griff. But that's still that 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 the fact that it has to trade with two Mold Drifters or a Spire Golem and some they there's no way to easily single block this. So I think that once people figure out how to make it work, it's going to be really really powerful. I think a better card for feeding it might be Seagate Oracle because it goes Seagate Oracle on three and then Wretched Griff the next turn rather than, you know, Mold Drifter on four, five, and then the next turn, a three, four. So I think Seagate Oracle, or even something as simple as Jeskai Sage, might be, you know, the key cards here. 
Very cool. And it sounds like there's just so much card advantage. If you're oh. casting a Seagate Oracle and getting a card into this and drawing a card, yeah. your hand's always going to be full in a deck like that. So that's pretty exciting. Moving on to number five on our list, we have something kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, a Mana Dork in Uvenwald Captive. So where does this one fit, Alex? So a little bit of background is that I'm a huge fan of the Zvi Moshewitz school of magic thought called Hypermana which is when everything in your deck is either mana or a threat. And the deck that kind of brought this to light, the first one he talked about is a Mythic from Shards of Alara Zendikar Standard. And that deck was just mana dorks like Elvish Mystic and Lotus Cobra and topped off with Sovereigns of Lost Alara, which then fetched Eldrazi Conscription and just was creatures and it attacked and it was just... A gross deck, and it did really well at U.S. Nationals in its year. Overworld Captive kind of is the perfect card for that strategy in Popper because Popper doesn't have a card that is Mana Acceleration that can then turn into a gigantic monster. Now, 4-6 may not seem that big, but when it blocks something like a Gurmag Angler, when it survives Flame Slash, when it has to trade with two Lightning Bolts, suddenly this card gets a lot more exciting. And in a dedicated ramp deck, this is a two-drop that, as early as turn three or four, becomes an absolute beast on the battlefield. And what really turns it from just okay into really great is the fact that on its front side, it has Defender. Because Overgrown Battlements in Popper, which is one in a green for an 0-4 wall that taps for green for each creature that has Defender on under your control. So suddenly, Overgrown Battlement into Uvenwald Captive is even more mana. So that that's what really excites me about this card. It would be higher if it, one and a green is a little much. It's, you know, not to get too nitty gritty, it's probably about half a mana more than you want to pay. But again, I've been testing with this card, and when someone has to waste two Lightning Bolts for your two drop, that is really just an excellent trade. Yeah, I mean, it solves one of the big problems with mana dorks that they just get worse as the game goes on. They're great on turn one or turn two, but then eventually you got more mana than you really need, and then you got a one, two. But this, like you said, becomes a big threat that actually can block or even attack through a lot of the big cards in the format. So it is pretty exciting. Yeah, again, in, in a test game, someone blocked this with Spire Golem, Spire Golem, and Mole Drifter. That's insane. They had a block with three creatures just to take it out. And if you're running any sort of removal, which, you know, you, you, Green does have Pit Fight, which is an instant speed removal spell, all of a sudden, this can absolutely wreck any combat. Yeah, it seems, it seems pretty powerful. Moving on to number four on our list, we have a really interesting card in Thermo Alchemist. So what kind of deck do you imagine this fitting in, Alex? Well, it's actually already made appearances in the Popper League in 250 Burn decks. Um, burn is not the place I went to first with this, but it is really, really strong in the Burn deck because it basically gives all your spells one extra damage. Popper is not a format with a lot of persistent sources of card advantage. There aren't Planeswalkers, but hard to deal with permanents tend to do very well. So you see cards like Curse of the Pierced Heart and Curse of the Bloody Tomb succeed because they're hard to stop. One damage adds up over time. A, a typical burn deck on turn three can cast three spells. So a Thermo Alchemist on the battlefield is three extra damage. When you realize that you can set it up with a card such as Rift Bolt, the damage starts to get even greater on any given turn. But what really, that that was not where my mind first went. My mind first went to the old Graveshot Storm combo, which is Graveshot's been banned because it was too good. But what you would do is you would cast a bunch of rituals, catch, cast a bunch of card filtering spells, and then you would just go for Graveshot. With Thermo Alchemist, it's kind of like Grape Shot. You know, you get it out on the battlefield, and then you start chaining together Rite of Flames and Dark Rituals. And then you start casting things like 
Simon Bloods or Monomorphos, and you keep going and you keep building more and more spells, and you can even give this haste with a card such as Expedite or Crimson Wisps. And that's where my mind went first, is the combo application of this, not the, not the kind of playing fair. I, this card has already seen play. It's going to continue to see play. I, I'm not a huge fan of it in Burn, because one of the reasons that Burn is a great deck, or even a great option, is that it obsoletes creature removal, which is very popular. And having a creature that you kind of need on the two, it, it, it slows down the deck just a little bit. Now, it's seen play, it's going to continue to see play, but it's the combo potential of Thermal Alchemist that really uh, turned on my radar. Well, moving on to number three, we have another Emerge card. We talked about one a little bit earlier. This one is It of the Horrid Swarm. Makes a couple of tokens when it enters the battlefield. So what are your thoughts on this one, Alex? It is the card that actually made me start thinking about the turn two Fierce Empath deck because this puts six power into the battlefield on turn three, potentially. It is as close as Pauper's going to get to a card like Grave Titan, but that's at common. So again, it has the cast trigger. They counter it, you still get two one ones. They use Flame Slash, you still get two one ones. It's just a lot of power and toughness for not that much investment. Eight mana seems like a lot, but if you sacrifice a Fierce Empath, if you sacrifice an Elvish Mystic, no, Elvish Mystic makes this cost five. That's not bad. That's actually pretty good. So you get this really strong power toughness bundle at a steep discount, and 4-4 four, four is a little small for the format because it does die to Flame Slash, it does die to Gurmag Angler in combat alone, but... When you have a creature this big, what you then realize is that, okay, I can run Pulse of Marasa and get it back, or I can just try to turbo it out, or it just it sits at the top of the curve, and even though it's 8 mana, if you have a 3-drop or a 4-drop in your deck, it can come down and start causing a lot of damage. It's really that ability, though, to come out quickly that makes it very uh, an attractive option for ramp decks and mid-range decks. So apparently Emerge, I guess we would have to say, is the best mechanic from Eldritch Moon for Pauper, because we've had two, I think the only two, common Emerge cards on our list. Yeah, whenever you can cheat mana in any way, things start to get a little uh, scary. And when you look at a lot of the cards we're talking about, Wretched Griff, Thermo Aquamist, It of the Hard Swarm, they all provide an effect that normally is worth mana at a steep discount. You know, so all these three cards, they have the ability to shave costs off. And in a format like Popper, where cost is so, it's a very cost sensitive format simply because things can spiral out of control if you're stuck with expensive cards in hand. Being able to reduce the cost on anything is just great. I mean, Gurmag Angler has taken over the format. Before that, Treasure Cruise took over the format before it got banned. Storm was great. You know, a lot of the cards on the Pauper ban list are there because they break the mana system. Cards with Storm, Cloud of Fairies, Frantic Search, Treasure Cruise. You know, we talked a little bit about Peregrine Drake. Because it breaks what it should cost, it, it reduces that immensely, it becomes dangerous. I think Ida the Hard Swarm and Wretched Griff are in the Gurmag Angler camp of being really good but not broken and not in the Treasure Cruise frantic search camp of, oh God, what have we done? <laughs> well, and this is only number three on our list. We got two more cards to go that are even ahead of It of the Horrid Swarm in all its power. So let's talk about number two. And... Honestly, I would not have picked this card out. When I when I saw this card, I did not think Pauper at all. So I'm really interested to see what you have to say about Ingenious Scob. So a 2-3 with Prowess for 3. What's the take on this one, Alex? So a card that saw a lot of play, probably more than anyone anticipated, was Frostburn Weird. Because it allowed bl aggressive blue decks to convert late game flood into extra damage. What Ingenious Scob does is that it does cost an extra mana up front, but it has prowess. 
And so every Gitaxian probe, every ponder, every preordain suddenly comes with kicker. This gets plus two, plus oh. And now your blue decks in the late game when they might need to be digging for more business, well, they also get to pile on the damage. And when you combine it with things like Gush, it can just get obscene quickly. You know, you tap two blue, you uh, return those islands to your hand, you Gush, you use one of those mana to pump this to a 4-3. And then what happens if you draw more spells? What happens if you draw a Vapor Snag? All these things. There's just a lot of potential here. And it probably doesn't fit into Delver as we know it, because Delver tends to run a lot of creatures, but any other very blue he- blue spell heavy tempo aggressive deck, we've seen some pop up with Nimble Mongoose and Delver of Secrets um, and Werebear. You might see some with Delver of Secrets, Jeskai Sage, and Ingenious Scab surrounded by Lightning Bolt. You know, suddenly it turns any spell into extra damage, and it it just has a very high ceiling. Now, I, I don't think it's the most likely to see immediate play, but I think once again, once it finds that right shell, kind of like Succumb to Temptation, it's going to be an all-star. Is this something you'd consider in a Kiln Fiend deck? Um, not the... Not the really fast Kiln Fiend decks. There are slower Kiln Fiend decks that exist. There's one that runs Mold Drifter and Compulsive Research. And I could see this there. Uh, same with Pyrehound from Shadows Over Innistrad. There's a slower, more incremental build that exists. But I think that in the really, really fast Kiln Fiend decks, uh, not unless cards like Disfigure and Deadweight are everywhere. Uh, the, being a 2-3 is very important, I'd say. All right. Well, we have finally made it to the very top of our list, the number one card on our list. And for our number one card, we have Bloodbriar. So another just interesting card it can potentially get big. Do you have an archetype in mind for this one, Alex? You know, this one is... It's a risky number one, but the potential is through the roof. When you look at Popper, the number of cards that say sacrifice somewhere on there that see play already is in- amazingly high from Terramorphic Expanse to Fume Spitter to Augur of Skulls to something like Atog. There's just an insane number of cards that say sacrifice on there. And a 2-3... It's reasonable. Three, four, four, three? Okay. But when you start getting into four, five, five, six, you're talking about something that's really much closer to Termagoyf than anything else. This is a three drop that can win a combat against a Gurmag Angler without much help. You know, it, there's just... This is definitely the riskiest because it's all about the potential. But when you have decks out there that are seeing play with... Bloodthrown Vampire and Nantuko Husk, suddenly it starts to make a lot more sense. There's a fringe, and then when I say fringe, it's a very fringe combo deck out there called, based on the old Pro Tour deck called Project X, which needs a Sacrifice Outlet, a Safe Hold Elite, and an Ivy Lane Denizen. And all it does is it makes an infinitely large 1-1, or uh, it, it needs a Carrion Feeder, basically, or a, a Nantuko Husk, but it makes it infinitely large because you sacrifice the Safe Hold Elite to it over and over again, and you use the Ivy Lane Denizen to put the one plus one plus one counter on the Safe Hold Elite, which negates the Persist effect, so you get to do it over and over again. And what Bloodbriar does it lets you have another giant threat on the battlefield. So that way they have to deal with two instead of one. Is this going to be good enough? I don't know. But the fact that there are cards like Seal of Fire, Seal of Doom, Executioner's Capsule, Font of Fertility, Sakura Tribe Builder, these are all cards that already exist. And it's a very lenticular card where it fits into so many different decks. I mean, I can tell you right now, Mark War Marshal, Keldon Marauders, and Fire Blast all have Sacrifice written on their card. And that's a lot of damage. So there's just a lot of different ways you can fit this card into existing decks. We've talked a lot about Moldrifter. Moldrifter, when you evoke it, that's a Sacrifice Clause. 
When you emerge a creature, that's a sacrifice clause. When you cast Thraben Inspector and sacrifice a clue, there's so much you can do with this one card. I'm really excited to see exactly how big it gets. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a huge popper expert, but one thing that I think would be sweet would be something involving this, and I think it's Fengrin Marauder, along with some egg type effects, Chromatic Sphere, Chromatic Star, kind of a cool, like, artifact life game combo deck. I think that could be a pretty fun, a fun deck to try out, at least. Whether it's good or not, I don't know. But this is kind of the card that gets all those... Uh, your brewer's juices flowing. There's just so many different possibilities. So I think it's a really good number one pick. Yeah, this set was really, really good for Popper. I, I think that there's there could have easily been, you know, I have written down another three or four cards that could have made the list, but just aren't quite there. Just the power level is through the roof for commons. And I think that what you're seeing is with the two set block model is that they can take a little more risks at common. You know, cast triggers are complex for common, but they did two of them. You see a new kind of mechanic in a card I didn't list, but Stencia Innkeeper, three, mo three and a red for a three, three that taps down a land. That seems pretty good, especially in a format that, you know, not to say it again, but it also combos with Peregrine Drake where you can just every turn tap down all your opponent's lands and just win that way. But it's just, I, that didn't make my top eight list. That's how strong the cards in this set are. Well, it's a really exciting time to be a Pauper fan for that exact reason. Uh, we had Eternal Masters that shook everything up and now one of the best Pauper sets of recent years. So that's super exciting. I'm excited. Uh, me too. Anyway, Alex, thank you so much for hanging out. I really appreciate getting your thoughts on these cards. Yeah, really happy to do it. Um, I think Popper's a great format. I think it's a great way to get into Constructed, especially on Magic Online. You know, even right now, despite the fact that there's a dominant deck, there are still people trying things out. And, you know, on any given day, anything can win. So I definitely recommend it to people who haven't given it a shot yet. Well, and I definitely recommend, if you are a fan of Popper or interested in learning about the format, you gotta, you gotta follow Alex. So look him up on Twitter or on Facebook, Nerd to the Core. Check out GatheringMagic.com where he has his articles. He does some awesome stuff with the data. So really, he's one of my favorite Popper uh, content producers to follow. So make sure to check that out. Anyway, thanks again, Alex, for hanging out for this video. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Definitely appreciate it, and we will talk to you soon.